Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the November 2022 episode of Galactic Terrors. This is our online reading series produced by the Horror Writers Association of New York. In the old days, before the pandemic closed things down in the city, we used to meet live and do lots of readings. And then we pivoted when everybody was staying home and started an online series. But you know what? We've been having so much fun with it. And we have people from all over the world tuning in and coming to read that we've kept going online. Now, you may notice something a little bit different. Instead of my usual co-host, James Chambers, welcome to Teal James Glenn, who is our guest co-host tonight. Thank you very much for stepping in, Teal. They'll never find his body. Ooh, or maybe just parts of it, right? Well, yeah, the yeah, ones yeah. I threw away. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Well, okay. There, there's something that really important that I have to share, and I've been doing this every month for a while. It's really exciting to know that there's only 355 days until Halloween. Okay. Yeah. That seems like a while, doesn't it? Okay. Well, I, I have a feeling that pumpkin spice will linger for a bit. And just as the fumes fade away, they will come back again. Okay. You know? Well, reading with us tonight to help celebrate our countdown until next year's Halloween will be Kenneth W. Kane, Nicholas Dyack, and Karen Hewler. And I'm looking forward to hearing their readings and chatting with them a little bit. Um, so they can tell us, or maybe you can tell us, Teal. So we've survived Halloween, right? Well, we're still on our feet, but... I don't know if we really have survived it. I think some of us died just a little bit <laughs> with the amount what? of ah, the gourds with the amount <laughs> of candy we've eaten. I think we probably <laughs> shortened some of our lives a little bit. Um, at least according you, to some nutritionists. Are you trying to tell me that Halloween is, is a, a holiday that is inspired by dentists? Is that what you're saying? Okay. I think it was probably part of uh, their plan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, lots of people did lots of fun things over Halloween, and I know many, many people were busy. This is a very busy time for the Halloween people, which is what we like to call our uh, uh, our horror writers. Um, but you and I did a, a fun event as well. We did a wolf event in New Jersey, an outside Halloween haunt. Werewolf. Their wolf. Ah, yes. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. But it was very fun, and we got to do uh, a bunch of shows outside, and I enjoyed very much seeing uh, Teal James Glenn as a very volatile and lively, shall I say, slightly crazy uh, preacher guy. And no, slightly about it. Mm, okay, okay. This was down at a park in New Jersey, and they had uh, Alex Dawson's group come in to put on a show that involved uh, a werewolf and George Washington's false teeth, which caused everyone to be um, taken over by wolves. So that was very yes, cool. It was at a colonial recreation village. Oh, look, it's mm -hmm. one of your ancestors. Yes, I got to be a colonial woman for a very short period of time. So that was fun. I tried to look meek and mild, although that's not usually me being meek and mild, right? I will say it was very much like being live in a hammer film it was, <laughs> it was dark it was night there were colonial buildings i was in that preacher's outfit in a real church and there were the howls of werewolves outside coming from the dark it yes was, it was actually nice and scary for the performers yeah and the best part was when all the neighborhood dogs would go berserk every time the wolf howled that was terrific yeah yeah <laughs> Well, uh, many people may or may not know uh, that we have a newsletter for Galactic Terrors as well. And one of the things that we've been doing recently is offering um, some giveaways for those folks who are on our newsletter. It's kind of an incentive or a nice ethical uh, gift to get people to sign up for our newsletter. So we have um, an ebook from each of our readers. It will be available for anybody who's on our newsletter. We'll do the drawing on Sunday night. So thank you to our our author readers and thank you to folks who are on the newsletter already and if you haven't joined already i'm let me just point out that jim chambers is really good at this and he usually does this all the techie stuff but uh so i'm doing it for the first time so if things are a little bit slow that's why please forgive me but please if you haven't joined our newsletter already join the galactic terrors newsletter and there's the link for it and we'll put that in the chat in uh in a few minutes um, so you can join the newsletter if you haven't. So um, we have a couple things that are coming up as well. In the local area is PhilCon, which is, uh, it used to be Philadelphia Con, but it's, it's just outside of Philadelphia in New Jersey and Cherry Hill. 
And a number of our HWA New York members will be there. It's not this coming weekend, but the following weekend on November 18th through 20th. And we'll have a table there and uh, a few books for sale at a time. And there are a bunch of our members will be doing readings and, and such. And that's at um, philcon.com. So um, let me put that in. Phil, philcon.org, right? I think so. Yes. Here it is, philcon.org. So if anybody's in the area and wants to come by and see some of us, that would be terrific. That's great. So um, what else is going on that's that's new and exciting today? Something in the Black Panther world, right, Jill? Yep. Uh, the premiere, uh, well, the, the first screenings tonight are of uh, Wakanda Forever uh, and uh, official opening. Um, mm -hmm. And from all I heard, it's it's an incredibly emotional picture where you, you need to bring uh, handkerchiefs to it. Um, yes. And I understand as usual, you need to stay for all of the closing clips at the end. Too, yes. Right? There's yeah. only one post credit, but it's, it's ah. uh, a very powerful supposedly. Okay. No one has revealed what it is yet. So. And something else exciting to share. Uh, Sheree Renee Thomas has just come out with Black Panther Panther's Rage, and this is the an adaptation of the landmark comic series itself. And she just came out with it, and I got a signed copy just recently in Multiverse, so I was very excited to get that. So that's cool. And uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention before we go into our readers is that there's a lot of stuff going on every month in the Horror Writers Association website on horror.org. They're doing a daily post this month for Veterans in Horror Spotlight. And today is the perfect day to mention that, right, Till? Yes, we are on the eve of um, Veterans Day, which was originally Armistice Day. Um, and for our Canadian friends, everyone, and in most of the British Isles, they're all wearing poppies. It was mm -hmm. a very famous poem written uh, in 1915 by a Canadian officer, John McRae, who um, wrote uh, In Flanders Fields Where Poppies Blow between the crosses, row on row. And um, that is the symbol now of fallen warriors in many other uh, English speaking nations. Here we celebrated, of course, tomorrow, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month is when the armistice was signed, which is uh, now called Veterans Day. So thank you for all who served. Excellent. Thank you. And the other thing that's happening uh, every day for a while on the HWA website is that there are people reading poems from the HWA um, anthology, the Poetry Showcase Volume 9. And you had you had a reading as well on there, Teal, right? Yes, I have a, a, storm, uh, a poem in there called Homebound. Excellent. Um, so uh, it, it's worth checking out. Um, cool. Very yeah. honored to be amongst the many really awesome poets in there. Yeah, and I think it's worth checking out each, uh, having a poet read their own work is really kind of awesome. So, yeah. Well, we've been chattering for a little bit here and I uh, think it'd be really cool if we hear some words from somebody else. How about um, from one of our authors, Kenneth Kane? Wanna All tell right. us about him, Teal? Yeah, well, Kenneth W. Kane is an author of horror, dark fiction, and spatterpunk. Uh, he's award-nominated freelance editor and graphic artist. Uh, and designer. To date, he's had over 100 short stories, 13 novels, novellas, as well as a handful each of nonfiction pieces, books for children, and poems released by many publishers, such as Crystal Lake and Journal Stone. He's also edited seven anthologies. Uh, Mr. Kane lives in Chester County, PA, with his family and suffers from chronic pain. As such, he likes to keep busy, spends most of his time working uh, rather than socializing. His full publishing history is available on his website at Kenneth W. Kane with a C dot com. Uh, Mr. Kane, take it away. window. A monster staggered down the barren street. Even one posed a significant threat to her survival. Valerie let the drape fall back into place, 
stared out through its thin fabric as night blotted the orange and red hues of the day. The monster's silhouette crossed the front lawn and she shrank away from the window. Halfway across the yard, the man paused and gazed up at the wavering curtain. Did he see me? Her heart leaped and she retreated behind the couch where she kept very still and tried to steady her nerves. The monster shuffled around outside the front door. When the doorbell rang, she jumped so much that her foot slid across the floor, producing a brief but loud squeak. Please just go away. She raised her eyes above the back of the couch and stared at the door. An unexpected screech of metal forced her back down to her knees. Her heart pounded as several items spilled in through the opening in the door. Even when the dead man trudged away from the door dissatisfied, she remained where she knelt in case he returned. Why do you bother looking out that damn window at all, Jasper said. His appearance startled her. She hadn't even seen him. Or maybe he'd been sitting there all along, dissecting her actions. Despite everything, he looked cool and calm. He wore that familiar sour expression she learned to disregard. She abandoned the area behind the couch and returned to the window. From this vantage point, she made sure the man outside had moved on, watching him stagger from the house from house to house. Only when the man could no longer be seen did she turn back to Jasper. Jasper's piercing gaze met hers, making her feel vulnerable. I was wrong to ignore him. She chewed a fingernail. You're right. I shouldn't. He leaned back in his rocking chair, hands folded across his chest. Damn right. It's like I always told you. What's out there ain't no good. You don't want no part of it. A grin spread across his lips that made her skin crawl. That was all true, of course. He'd been telling her this since the day they met. That seemed so long ago now. Everything went to hell so fast. She'd been lucky Jasper had been there to protect her, to bring her here where she could, where he could take care of her. So why test him then? She dismissed the concern and allowed herself forgiveness. I know, it's just that, what? He raised an eyebrow. You miss it? She did too, with all her heart. She missed having someone to talk to, maybe a person who would relate to her situation. There have been others, of course, but all of them had been older and not one had ever returned once they went upstairs. She hated those stairs. Just the thought, thought of them made her, made her shudder. Well, don't, Jasper said. We got everything we need right here. And mind what I learned you, or you'll spend a week in your hole of a bedroom. He beamed his awful grin, providing her a perfect view of, his, of, the, of an empty gap between his yellow teeth. Or maybe I'll take you upstairs and remind you who's in charge around here. The threat concerned her enough, she conceded. Jasper pushed up from his rocker. Both the wood and his bones cracked. There are more of them out there now. I think it's time we got some shut-eye and let matters settle. What do you think? He crossed the hardwood floor to the stairs. She followed. There they parted ways. This surprised her, and more so when he ascended. She tried not to watch, but couldn't help but notice how hard it had become for him. Certain he'd forgotten, she headed for the musty closet beneath the stairs. With some effort, she pulled open the door and slid inside. After a brief pause, she shut the door and waited for the sound of the deadbolt, but it didn't come. He must have forgotten, or maybe he trusted me enough not to lock it. The sound of the deadbolt sliding into place indicated otherwise. Part of her remembered having broken this lock once. Surely he would have repaired it by now, but for the life of her, she couldn't recall when he'd had, he had the chance. It couldn't have been that long ago. Then again, time moved differently these days. Being so weak and hungry made it hard to remember much of anything, let alone when the deadbolt had been fixed. Also, Jasper hadn't gone out for food in a long time, so most of her thoughts were consumed with memories of specific tastes. She considered herself, she considered testing the door and even lifted herself up on her haunches to do so. But as she reached for the handle, she heard him climbing the stairs again and stopped herself. Each footstep came heavier than the last. Jasper got so angry whenever her faith in him wavered. She wiped her sweaty palm on her torn jeans and slipped into her makeshift bed. This was the only place she felt safe anymore, although cramped. Her worn blanket and shoddy pillow offered some comfort. She pulled the cover over her body, and when sleep finally found her, she dreamed of better days, back when she'd been innocent and this world hadn't yet perished. 
She thought him charming, but at 12, her heart tended to flutter at the slightest bit of attention. Still, he compelled her to divulge secrets that made her blush. And with no one there to keep her in check, she would have revealed most anything if he'd asked. The, he, they spoke of topics that made her curious, so it had been natural for her want, to want to know more. Plus, she liked the way he brushed his long hair back from his collar and cocked an eyebrow whenever he asked an, her an inappropriate question. She answered every query, no matter how dirty it made her feel. Some even flushed her cheeks. But she answered them all, rocking back and forth on the park swing. He listened and stared how the dead, he listened and shared how the dead had started coming back to life. She didn't believe him, of course, not at first. But then he pointed one out to her, and although she couldn't see the man, panic consumed her. Before she got a, could get a good look, he'd swept her up from the swing. As frightened as she felt, she let him. His terror seemed to equal her own, thus heightening her fear. She saw something else, too, the way he kept licking his lips in a creepy and weird way. By the time she knew what was going on, he had her in his car and whisked her away to what he insisted would be a safe place. She roused from the dark and saw him staring at her in the darkness of her room. Not again. She shrank away. Her blanket snagged on the rough floor and hindered her progress, but still she wriggled away while wrestling the blanket. She squirmed back like a worm until she hit the wall. Pressing her eyes shut, she opened them to the door and his face began to dissipate. What made me think he was there? Sorry, my fingers are dry. She squinted. That knot in the heart in the wood, maybe. There had once been paint there. Over time, it had become faded and worn, replaced by dried blood stains from her fists. Awareness dawned on her as she spied the trickle of light beneath the door. Oh God, it must be morning. He detested when she overslept. If he caught her, he'd be angry, might even punish her or take me upstairs. She tugged her shirt down to cover her belly and reflected on her dream for a brief, brief moment. She'd come here of her own free will without even her mother's knowledge. To think Jasper's hair had only been a wig. That day when she'd first seen his mottled scalp and receding hairline, it had sickened her. How old was he back then? She remembered thinking him much older than she originally believed. He must be quite old now. She stepped to the door and waited for the deadbolt to slide away. When it didn't, she assumed he'd already unlocked it. Pushing the door open an inch, she leaned forward and stared out through the crack. The early afternoon light revealed an empty room, no sign of Jasper. Opening the door wider, she stepped out into the living room. When she turned to shut the door, his voice started at her. Well, well, looky who finally woke up. Her heart leaped, pounding out several hurried beats before settling. She didn't want to look him in the eye, but did so anyway. Sorry, I didn't sleep well. Convinced this would be enough, she stood before her window and waited for a reply. When he, when he didn't protest, she took her from her familiar spot and gazed out at what remained of the world. There were so many dead outside today. Most stuck to groups of two or three as if socializing. Others roamed about with no apparent purpose. One dead woman chased after a dog, its leash dragging in the street. She's going to eat that dog. After all these years, you still refuse to give up on them, don't you? He said. She didn't answer. They'll kill you if you go out there. You know that's the truth. She did. Bastards will tell her, tear their flesh right off your damn bones. He hummed knowingly. She ignored him, her focus on two of the dead, watching them disappear into houses. Another stemmed out, stumbled out of the house next door. There must have been a dozen dead out there at any given moment, all of them ignorant to her existence. She needed to keep it that way. But what good is life if I'm stuck here? Jasper interrupted her thoughts. Bastards tore my dog's guts right out. All those others in the basement, too. His voice sounded stern and unappreciative of the fact she resented being holed up with him. You don't want to end up like them, do you? No, I don't. She shook her head and stepped away from the window. She'd return when there weren't so many of them, so many, and Jasper wasn't around. Although she remained grateful for the brief moments he afforded her at the window each day, there hadn't always that hadn't always been the case. Stare out that cursed window if you must, it'll do you no good, 
He cricked his back and started up the stairs already, already laboring. I've been up since very early and need to go, lay down a spell. Mind how long you stare out that window daydreaming or I'll have you upstairs. Sometimes she wondered about the last two girls he'd taken upstairs. She'd heard muffled screams for weeks on end. Their constant weeping still haunted Valerie's dreams now and then. She gazed up at the stairs. I haven't heard them in so long. An hour or two passed before she could return to the window. There wasn't much left to eat. She found a few stale crackers and drank water straight out of the faucet. The crackers didn't sit right in her stomach. They felt like a moldy lump that wanted to come back up. She ran to her closet several times afterward to retch into her waste bucket, but nothing came out, and her insides continued to squirm. Why hasn't he gone for food? Through her window, she spied one of the dead ambling to the end of the driveway. The woman stood beside a mailbox, staring off across the road. Then she opened the mailbox and pawed inside. Valerie nearly fainted. The plague, it must be fading. Perhaps everyone would be cured in time. Unable to contain herself, she hurried up the stairs. But in her excitement, she'd forgotten his rules, how she wasn't allowed upstairs without his permission. I should. Her foot reached the landing, and she froze in place, quivering. She considered withdrawing the foot, but couldn't will it to move. She took a deep breath and pushed herself up, tiptoeing to the first room. A battered bed with torn sheets draped over half the mattress set in the middle. A woman bound in chains lay on the bed, her naked body deteriorated. A bright red ball held her mouth ajar in an eternal scream. Sorrow consumed Valerie. She forced herself to continue down the hall. In the next room, a woman lay in a fetal position upon the bed. The white shroud she wore offered Valerie an unnatural view of the woman's bony frame. A look of terror and hopelessness defined the woman's hollowed face. Tears stung Valerie's eyes. They'd suffered and she felt guilt for wishing at times they would stop their insistent scream, crying. Even if they had been infected, no one deserved this fate. She arrived at the last room, the door still closed. This would be Jasper's room. She dried her cheeks with her sleeve. If he saw her crying, he'd punish her. What would he do to me then? Would he chain her to one of those beds? She'd never been able to endure such an atrocity to her current state. But she'd come this far, and she'd only had to turn the knob. Then she could confront him, tell, her how, tell him how she no longer cared whether the dead ate her or not. She mustered up what little courage she could, opened the door, and entered with her eyes pressed shut. She refused to op open them until she stood in the center of the room. Gradually, she eased them open, unnerved, unnerved by what she saw through mashed eyelids. He lay in his bed with his sheets drawn up to his neck. The linens had sunken into his chest and stomach. They outlined his bones, making him look like one of those skeletons from science class. His mouth hung agape, the swollen tongue poked out over cracked blue lips. His teeth were more yellow now, wide-eyed. He stared up at the ceiling. Moving beside, moving bedside, she stared down at his wrinkled face. His eyes had turned into dark pools that filled the whole socket. The corner of each, sorry, the corners of each angled down. She leaned in close. Jasper? He jolted upright and she leaped away. She landed several feet from his bed and raised her hands to defend herself. Chest heaving, she scanned the bed, only to discover he hadn't moved. What just happened? Again, she approached him, this time refusing to get so close. She spoke in a quiet tone. I'm leaving. It felt good. She gathered up what strength she had left and added, and I'm never coming back. With much effort, she turned and hurried down the hall. Something plodded along after her. She heard bony heels thumping along, along the wooden floor. Rotten teeth chattered. She rushed past each door, trying not to look. Yet at both doors, her eyes betrayed her. She couldn't even slow herself when she reached the stairs. Before she could brace herself, she slipped, down, she slipped and bounced down the staircase on her rear. Ending up on the last stair, she righted herself and spun around fast. To her surprise, Jasper wasn't there. She waited, listening for the slightest sound, only to hear her own labored breath. Beneath her feet, a massive pile of unopened letters lay scattered on the floor. Her eyes rose from the mail to the door. 
It should be so simple to open, yet she knew how difficult it would prove. Am I really unafraid? From this vantage point, she could see through the faded drapery of her window. Several of the dead still wandered around outside. Surely they'd see her, but I have to go. You can't, Jasper said. His voice scared her, and he spoke as if he'd heard her thoughts. She didn't respond. They'll eat you, I swear it. She rose from the step, her bumps and bruises complained. Let them. Don't do it. She wanted to run when he approached. Instead, she stood her ground. His voice boomed. Don't you open that goddamn door. She turned to him and whispered, I'll never listen to you again. With that, Jasper seemed to weaken. His form faded until no longer there. She stared at the place he'd been. Tears streaked down her cheek. And for a brief second, she wasn't sure she could find the strength. She seized the doorknob, took a deep breath, and yanked the door open. Shielding her eyes from the light, she stepped out onto the porch. The instant smell of flowers assaulted her senses, bringing, her, bringing back memories of her mother's garden. She eased down the stairs to the grass. A dead woman's head turned up. Her mouth opened as if to speak, but no words came out. The woman ran for Valerie. Valerie saw this and collapsed. The feel of the grass and the aroma of summer pleased her. The sun warmed her. A light breeze drifted across the yard. She heard noises she recognized and others she wouldn't, she couldn't place. All of it excited her. Behind the woman, others noticed Valerie. At least six of them started her way, maybe more. There would be no escape, and that was okay. She curled up on the grass and waited. If this is what God will have of me, so be it. They were upon her, all around her. The pitter-patter of her heart shifted to the loud thump of a bass drum. The woman knelt beside her. Her hands pulled at Valerie, who let herself be lifted. She felt the woman's arms embrace her. Unsure of what to expect, expect, Valerie stiffened. Her eyes widened with panic. She looked at them one by one, gulped down a deep breath, and held it in while she awaited the inevitable. And that is Valerie's window. Again, from uh, Embers, from Crystal Lake. Wow. Clap, clap. Yeah. <laughs> I have to apologize to you because since I'm new at this, I had you muted for the first couple of seconds. So we, I'm glad you said it was Embers at the end. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. And that, that's a collection of your stories, right? Yeah. Yeah. From Crystal Lake Publishing. Cool. Cool. And is it fair to say that that's one of your favorite stories in the collection? Um, no, it's just one that I haven't read in a while and, and uh, okay. Heather, Heather had wanted me to read it. So. <laughs> ah, ah. Well, you really you had me going there because I'm thinking at the beginning, oh, what he promised would be a safe space. I'm thinking, oh, no, there's this old guy taking this kid, you know, and then it I don't know if that turned out to be better or worse where she wound up, you know. So when I wrote this a long time ago, uh, I, I had just taken this class um, from Gary Bronbeck about subtext. Mm -hmm. So this whole story was about, you know, accomplishing some subtext and and, uh, you know, trying to say things without writing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And layers and layers like an onion, right? Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. So you have um short pieces and some long pieces, yes. And what what do you like writing more? You know? Um, I don't really I don't really prefer one over the over the other. When I sit down to write, I just let my uh let let the story tell itself. So whatever it ends up being long or short, and you know, I have like maybe hundred or two hundred stories that are in various stages that at all times. So I just pick whatever calls to me. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> just like Jasper's calling to her. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all your stories are upstairs dead in the bed, right? And they're yeah, calling yeah, to me. Yeah. I understand now. Yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting though, because novellas are much more popular these days than, than they have been in the past from what I understand. So that might suit if you're just writing your particular story you know, it could come out any length, I guess. Yeah, I've actually been focusing on longer works now. So, um, okay. Just over it. I mean, I have it. I guess I say that and I have a short story collection coming out next year. So, yeah, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So, I, I was, I was also interested. And if anybody has any questions that they'd like us to ask Kenneth, go ahead and put them in the chat, please. Um, but in the meantime, I am intrigued by the fact that you are an editor as well as an author. And I have been doing sort of the same thing. Do you find that the editing affects how you write? 
Uh, definitely. I mean, and every everything I edit affects it. So it's not even like, you know, just the, you know, the best of the stories. It's all the stories and everything I read. Uh, I, I, I edit and I read very slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to, you know, dissect everything. And uh, yeah, so it definitely, I mean, you, you should see that in my writing. Like if you go to my earliest stories and compare them to what I'm writing now, you should see like a definitely definite progression. <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, that's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I wound up uh, being uh, the volunteer editor for a charity anthology where we had a bunch of authors contributing, uh, editors contributing their time. So I sort of rode herd on everybody. I read all the stories, the edit comments. I worked with the authors going back and forth. And I learned so much by seeing what editors said to the author about the story. And it was a really, you know, like a crash course way to learn things. It was really, oh, yeah, really, exactly. really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's Very definitely neat. like one of the, um, I think it's been like one of the most transforming things in, in my writing career is to edit. Yeah. You know, I mean, I never expected to edit. That just kind of happened. People just started asking me to, and, and mm -hmm. they still ask me to. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. Well, you got some, you got some nice comments in the chat. And we also have a question from Chris Ryan. How soon into the conception or first draft process do you know how long it will be? Well, so I just, um, when I write, I just kind of get into the story. Like uh, I might start it like, uh, I treat it like a job. So I might start at like five o'clock in the morning. And then next thing you know, I come out of it and it's like three, three o'clock in the afternoon. So, <laughs> so I really get into it. And so I don't really um, pay attention to length at all. When I uh -huh. get out of it, it, that first draft is kind of like really rough, you know, and um, I kind of set it aside for a while. So I have a lot of these drafts set aside at all times. and. Uh, when I pick one back up, that's when I know whether it's going to be long or not. I uh, look for like what I think the plot should be. You know, when one calls to me and I pick it up and start working on it for sure, that's when I decide how long it's going to be and, and how, you know, how complex I want it to be and everything. <laughs> well, your fellow reader, Nick, says you're a time budgeting beast. So, yeah, that, that is impressive, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you so for, much for reading with us and answering a few questions. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you come back at the end and chat with us, uh, with, with all of us at the end. Sure. Thanks, uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, what I'd like to do now is introduce our next reader, Nicholas Dyack, who is an interdisciplinary pop culture scholar whose specialties include Italian genre cinema, sword and sandal media, exploitation and cult films, industrial and synthwave music, and cosmic horror studies. He's the editor of the academic collection, The New Peplum, and has had essays published in other books, such as James Bond and Popular Culture, Uncovering Stranger Things, Horror in Space, and the upcoming books, The Many Lives of the Twilight Zone, and, well, that's not even upcoming, that's, that's here, and A Hero Will Endure, Essays on Gladiator. He's presented his work at numerous conferences, but can easily be found twice a month with Michelle Brittany, who read with us last month, hosting the HP Lovecast podcast, and he's also a hardcore cocktail enthusiast. I would like to have you welcome Nicholas Dyack. Hi everyone, it's uh, good to see you all. Um, my name is Nick Dyack. I'll be reading a very, 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 very abridged version of my essay, Meteorite Madness, Lovecraftian Horror and Consumerism in Small Town USA from Horror and Space. And it wouldn't be an appearance if I didn't have a tiki drink. I am having a shrunken skull. Let's go for it. Though perhaps not consciously executed by the filmmakers, but when viewed as a whole, the meteorite horror subgenre of films takes on attributes that make them critical of the rise of consumerism in America from the 1950s and beyond, and its possible negative effects on small town America. Bruce Kaywin first recognized this association in his essay that appeared in the Criterion Collection release of The Blob. Quote, they may have felt frightened as consumers, not just as movies goers, as they watched a hungry mass comparable to, if not incarnating, the growing consumerism of 1950s America devour their kind. If they had forgotten the war and wanted to live in a world of play, their complacent desire to stuff themselves of goods and good time 
had shown itself to be a monster, end quote. While Kaywin's observation is exclusively directed toward the blob, his musing is applicable to describing how meteorite monsters can be perceived in other films of the subgenre, both old and new. Excluding the Farba and Die Monster Die, which are set in Europe, the other films in the subgenre all include entities and maladies that are just as allegorical as the blob is at projecting fears of American consumerism and its effects on small town communities and their relationships. Since these films are all set in small town communities or near their outskirts, the focus becomes even narrower on the effects of consumerism on the small town, one of the last bastions of the American dream in idyllic lifestyles. So cut, 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 cut all the boring stuff because we're going to stick with monsters. Having firmly established that small town America is an ideological construct to showcase an establishment untarnished by consumerism, the focus needs to be turned to the meteorite monsters themselves and how they demonstrate conflict of values. This is done by the monster taking on the mantle of the outsider. Levy uh, describes the narrative structure of small town films using outsider characters as having three distinct phases. The first phase is that the outsider arrives in town, which disrupts any state of normality or equilibrium. The second phase of the film demonstrates the effects of the outsider has on the town, the actual turmoil or conflict, while the final phase has the outsider either leave the town or integrate into it. The outsider could be many types of characters, such as drifters, hitchhikers, persons newly moved into town, or even folks returning to their hometown after extended residency elsewhere. Now, Levy's definition of the outsider is anchored to realistic films and needs to be expanded in order for meteorite monsters to be considered a small town outsider. While by default, these creatures originate from the far reaches of space, so they're inherently outsiders by definition. But semantics aside, what's important is the role the meteorite monster fulfills mirrors the role of a traditional outsider in the three-part configuration proposed by Levy. The blob illustrates the role of the outsider perfectly. For the first phase, the blob crash lands on the outskirts of town and sets off some chain reactions. The town's doctor, a symbol of leadership and authority within the community, is eaten, therefore setting up instability. At the same time, the protagonist's teenagers are pitted against adults, challenging their role in the community. Teenagers are normally relegated to the role of children or pranksters and not to be taken seriously, but in The Blob, as well as in the sequel and the remake, they are the driving force to combat, combat the viscous menace and eventually win over the police and adult authority. The Blob terrorizes the colonial movie theater, consuming the patrons inside, desecrating an important public gathering space. In a scene that embodies complete consumerism, the Bob is the Blob is also encountered at Jerry's Supermarket, a grocery store owned by Steve McQueen's character, his dad. It is here that the teenagers attempt to rally the town and convince them of the existence of the Blob menace and, semiotically, the consumerist menace, which initially fails. All these scenarios unfold during Levy's second stage of the Outsider film. While the third stage sees the blob frozen and vanquished to its polar prison, expelled from the community. Beware the blob and the 1988 incarnation follow this outsider formula as well, with some minor substitutions. The sequel replaces the theater of a bowling alley, while the remake replaces it with a church. All three locations shown are public pillars and gathering locations for the community being greatly disrupted. Now, the monolith monsters adheres to the outsider format too, even though the rocks in it are not living entities. The meteorite obtains its outsider status by crashing the desert mountains outside of town, but being brought in accidentally by a local geologist and a young girl on a field trip. The town is soon thrown into disarray as the monoliths destroy homesteads on the outskirts of town and drain silicon from the residents, turning them into rock. With the telephones out, the town looks to the youth to disperse bulletins to each house, one by one on their bikes, much like newspaper delivery boys. For this mass communication, technology has failed, but the small town values of personal relationships and youth candor prevail. While in the blob, the town is only partially comes together, in the monolith monsters, the town maintains its unification with a little internal strife. The monoliths are banished from the town by being neutralized by a saltwater flood. 
While the consumer angle in the Monolith Monsters is lighter when compared to other entities in the canon, the actions of the ever-growing and ever-consuming monoliths do reinforce the meteorite monsters as outsider's concept. Now, Slither is an interesting outlier in that it depicts the battle of a small town versus consumerism even before the arrival of the meteorite and its alien inhabitant. The opening shots of Slither portray the town in a hyper idyllic fashion by showing the town surrounded by lush forested foothills. The town is a flutter for an upcoming community event. The next shot shows a prominent ad for Coke on the side of a building and is immediately followed by scenes of transients and graffiti covered walls. The editing of the sequence in this particular order can imply a relationship between Coke and small town decay. The alien from the meteorite starts as an outsider, but enters the community by taking control of another character, Michael Rooker's character. As in the blob, there's a grocery store scene in which Michael Rooker tries to purchase as much meat as possible from the butcher to satiate his hunger. Relationships in the town begin to crumble slowly at first between Michael Rooker and his wife, Elizabeth Banks, in a marital sense, to outright anarchy as the slug aliens infect, kill, eat, and absorb the town's populace, including the mayor, into its hive collective. The giant uh, Michael Rooker monster hybrid in Slither is banished from the community by way of death from a propane tank explosion. Now, in all these films, the town's police force suffers the most negative effects from the arrival of the outsider meteorite monster, as they are portrayed as incompetent or inept. In the original Blob, Sergeant Jim Burt is antagonistic to the teenagers, theorizing they're all conspiring against him to try and break him. He treats all their actions to warn the town as pranks, which of course stymies their efforts. In Beware the Blob, Sheriff Jones attempts to stop the Blob by burning down the bowling alley despite people still being trapped inside. He is unable to even light his own torch, and a Bowie Scout must do it for him. His inability to grasp the situation carries to the final scene. While seeking the limelight from a news crew, his legs become enveloped by the Blob that was able to ooze out of its frozen confines. In the 1988 version of The Blob, Deputy Bill Briggs mimics his Sergeant Burt counterpart of the original by his overtly hostile demeanor to the teenagers. But this film steps up the incompetency of authority up a notch by showing both the police and the military as ineffective at dealing with The Blob. Time and time again, the military, led by Dr. Meadows, fails to contain The Blob, instead allowing it to run rampant and considering the town and its populace expendable. Finally, in Slither, the entire police force is portrayed as particularly inept, but this is mostly done for comedic value. The town's officers and even secretary all get decimated or absorbed into the Slither hive, leaving only police chief Bar Bill Party, Nathan Fillion, as the last man standing. Though the hero of the story, Party is extremely clumsy at handling the alien menace, best demonstrated when his grenade is knocked from his hands by Grant and into the swimming pool. If there is an exception to this depiction of the police in the meteorite hilt films, it is the deadly spawn. The police arrive at the end of the film and without hesitation work with the locals at cattle prodding and burning the spawn menace. In these films, the monster unleashed by the meteorite enters the community as an outsider. Aside from the monster actually eating the inhabitants, the town is thrown into disarray with figures of authority such as doctors and mayors eaten, police force unable to handle the crisis, and the personal relationships between each other, especially between the youth and authority, challenged. As dictated by Levy's configuration at the film's end, the monsters are removed from the community. They're frozen, blown up, or destroyed by other means. However, to subvert this point in a true Lovecraftian sense, the monsters aren't not vanquished, as the frozen blob will thaw and the infected cat at the end of Slither will return. The horrors of the monsters and the infringing consumerist beliefs on small towns are not truly defeated, merely stalled for the time being. All right, thank you. Hello, Nicholas. Hi. I have to say, I love the whole subject matter. Um, Man Eater, Surrey Green, and uh, the Quatermass Experiment are two of my favorite, but they're Euro, so they don't quite count for these. But um, you know, they're they're about alien stuff coming mm -hmm. down in meteors. 
I actually stunt coordinated the sequel to Deadly Spawn. No way. Metamorphosis. Yeah. There wasn't much, but we did a little in, in, in Jersey City and, and Hoboken. So uh, it's very funny that this is all connected. I want to ask you, how do you get into um, all of the different things that you're in? I mean, I, I know some of us have a specific obsession with the swashbuckler films or Star Wars or whatever. You seem to have wonderful obsessions with at least a dozen different pop culture um, milieu. How does that get, how do you start in that and then say, I'm going to go for that? You know, that's a, it's an interesting question. It's not something I really thought of consciously, but I've always been kind of attracted to the more subaltern and niche things. Usually because I, I really like, you know, the cult films, the exploitation, the films that, and not just films, but other texts, comics, video games, uh, and so on that don't get enough attention anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm usually diving to that stuff to, you know, watch for fun or whatnot. And it's usually when, you know, watch or consuming in the case of this uh, presentation, one of these texts that usually an idea goes off, says, oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, this text is subverting something or seeing something interesting. And what I usually do is I have a corkboard app and I'll, you know, put my idea or brainstorm uh, idea there. And it's just, usually this comes from exploring a lot of alternative media, I guess. And then when I go kind of search, who else has said something about this? I'll find like a gap. Actually, no one else has said something about this. No one else is studying this. So, and I come to save the day. I'm like, you know what? I will be the person that try to write a weird esoteric essay on this or edit a book or something. <laughs> Well, I, I I used to haunt all the midnight shows in New York, which in the, you know, when I was going to college and after, there were a lot of them. So all of the niche stuff. Um, I mean, my favorite movie of all time is It the Terror from Beyond Space. So um, the fact that you, you seem to find a lot of these crevices that other people have sort of just passed over and go, no, I'm going to pause here and look at it. Uh, how did you get into Peplum? You know, uh, okay. Which, way, for, for those who don't know, Peplum is sword and sandal stuff. Hercules, mm -hmm. Machiste, and all of that. Sons of Hercules. It was a. Uh, it was actually kind of on accident. I was working. I was going to propose my first book, which was going to be on industrial music, and I'd spent months and months putting this proposal together on industrial music and why is it important and all this other stuff that, to pitch to my soon-to-be publisher McFarlane. But I wanted a backup plan. And at the same time, a movie just came out in theaters called Gods of Egypt. And apparently yeah, we went and saw it. I liked it. Uh, but it was getting a lot of negative press because of its, you know, representation of Egyptians. I'm like, you know, what? that's kind of an important thing. My um, girlfriend, Michelle, and I were in the car talking about the movie and representation and kind of other things. Um, and I kind of realized, you know, Gods of Egypt and all these other kind of post-Peplum films after Gladiator, you know, uh, flash in the pan, they would come, they would go and kind of leave the consciousness out there. And so I said, you know, what? I'm going to pitch a, a backup proposal to my publisher. And I think I spent one night on it, this of cranking course. it out, <laughs> sent both proposals in, and that's the one they went with. Of and course. so I, yeah. uh, oh, now I have to become a super expert in it because, you know, beforehand, I, uh, my master's thesis was on a, an Italian director, Antonio Margaretti. He did his fair share of peplum. So yeah. I was very familiar with like Italian peplum. So I had to dig back into that, grab the new stuff. And when you like what I do is when I get singularly focused on a topic and bring it all in, that's when appreciation of the topic comes out and adoration from it. And that's that's kind of what happened at sword and sandal stuff. I, I think it's great because I, I think. Uh, most of my interests become hobbies, become obsessions, which end up as careers. So um, I think it's a, a logical way to go. The latest one that you're, you're soliciting for a book is something completely outside of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, you didn't want to talk about it. but Oh, no, I can't. What made you decide there needs to be a book about Emmanuel? I can I, it's a very similar story. So yes, I have a call for papers on the Emmanuel uh, French erotic films and also the Italian knockoffs, the Black Emmanuel films. Uh, that came about maybe started 15 years ago. Um, I was, of course, you know, kid growing up, Cinemax, HBO. I knew about the Emmanuel films, but um, 
in the late 2000s, when I was back in school, really laser focused on uh, Italian cinema and writing my master's thesis, that's when I came across the Black Emmanuel films, which were Emmanuel knockoffs starring Laura Gimser. And I'm, I'm like, man, those Italians, they will knock off anything. And, <laughs> and, and that was kind of, you know, that, that's what they do. Jaws comes out, so they make a Jaws knockoff. A zombie movie comes out, they make all the zombie knockoffs. And, you know, usually their knockoffs are way better than they have any right to be. Sure, they're low budget, but they're very, ex uh, not exploitative, but very boundary pushing than what you would see in the American counterparts. And so I discovered the Black Emmanuel films, and right then and there was another, you know what? Put it in the idea board. There is no literature out there on either Manuel or Black Emmanuel at all, and it just kind of stayed there. And so this year, a Sylvia Christel biography came out, and I'm like, that's it. Yep. Time to get off my duff and, and do this book because no one else is going to do it. There's still a knowledge gap for this. I'm going to try to be the one to fill it. <laughs> ah, I think that's great. I, I, it's, it's, it's a wonderful working uh, hypothesis for how to get your stuff going. Let me see if we got any questions for you. <laughs> um, uh, okay, may, here's one. What would you uh, recommend uh, to fit within your uh, reading topic for this evening? Okay, so I talked about meteorite, um, Lovecraftian films. Um, I, I talked about the monolith monsters. I'm going to bring that up again. It is the funniest idea for a film that it turned out to be a really good 1950s I, atomic era. I agree. It's so much better than it has a right to be from the concept. It does, the, the movie is seriously about giant rocks that topple over, and if you get hit by them, you turn into stone yourself. And anytime they get splashed with water, they multiply. That's it. It's, it's the exact same thing when you get like those – I think they equate it to like those crystal kits where you put like crystal yeah. in water. And it go, that's the plot and of the it, And it has much better special effects than it has a right to have. It does, and, 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 and it's surprisingly very fun, and for such a low-concept movie, you know, this is a movie that's, you know, you know uh, in competition of, you know, other B-atomic era films like, you know, the, them with the ants or, uh, um, uh, blah, 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 what's, uh, well, Deadly Mantis or yeah, all, all of that it. stuff, and so how do you make rocks <laughs> intimidating, and they pulled it off, so that kind of, one, fascinates me, and two, it is, it's a way better B film with a silly premise than it has to be, it takes itself seriously surprisingly it, but it works and so i would recommend folks hunting down a copy of monolith monsters as a a very under the radar b film from the 50s and then on the other side of the spectrum i would probably recommend slither because i think everyone's seen that one but it's a legit good and funny <laughs> movie about you know alien parasites that are taking us all over but that movie is carried on nathan fillion's back with his you know uh, deadpan <laughs> expressions of every time something goes wrong well here's another question for you mm -hmm. from john lawson how much crossover is there between the niche interests for instance uh we'll see anything from this intersection of industrial music and lovecraftian horror which i know appeals to john <laughs> <laughs> You know, someday, John, I actually have a brainstorming list of not Lovecraftian horror and industrial music, but Hellraiser in industrial music. The first Hellraiser movie is the most industrial thing out there, and in turn, it influenced a lot of industrial stuff. I mean, the original soundtrack was done by Coil. Um, you know, it had its uh, influence on goth subculture as people dressing up in latex, going to the clubs, but also so many bands. I mean, how many industrial bands do you know of, you know sample the in jesus wet dialogue from the film so there is a very back burner essay someday that will come out of industrial music and hellraiser as far as lovecraft eh, we'll see there's lovecraft actually finds its uh, way into metal more than industrial there is so many death black and power metal bands out there that um rock out to lovecraft or adapt a lot oh and dungeon synth too that take in all the lovecraft stuff Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. We'll have you back at the end. Um, I'm going to introduce now our next reader for the evening, um, Karen Euler. Her stories have appeared in over 120 literary and speculative magazines and anthologies, including Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction and an upcoming issue of Asimov's. And she's won multiple awards. Her last novel, The Splendid City, was ridiculous and funny and horrible and true. I've heard her do a reading from it. Yes, to all of that. Her new collection, A Slice of the Dark, is a bit darker, 
and a lot weirder. Uh, more about her at Karen Hewler. That's E-U-L-E-R dot com. Take it away, Karen. Oh, just a quick note to unmute, Karen. Sorry. I said I would remember, and I did not. My apologies. I'm going to be reading from a story called Teeth. Isabel had always had beautiful teeth until the day she looked into the mirror and saw, saw that her right incisor had grown. Not much. No one else would notice. She liked to grin. She genuinely liked people, so the smile wasn't forced. She would see someone who made her eyes widen, and she would grin and tilt her head just the slightest and run over there with her hands outstretched. And this was how she pictured herself. The one tooth grew and grew, and her grin became lopsided, and she became self-conscious about it. No one notices, really, her friend Robin assured her. I didn't notice until you pointed it out. We will love you no matter how you look. When did that other tooth grow so long, by the way? It was true. All her teeth were growing. Now when she grinned, people's eyes shifted and they looked uneasy. Not only her teeth were growing, her mouth was growing as well, getting wider. Her lips could no longer sit together either. The teeth pushed her lips out. People stared at her now. It horrified her at first because her appearance still came as a shock. She sometimes forgot it, but then it became impossible to forget, and she hated those who recoiled from her, hated the way she felt they were justified. From there, she grew to irritation, contempt, hatred, so much so that she began to growl when she saw their looks deep in her throat, letting it flutter there and then letting it rise. People stepped back and looked away. She caught sight of herself in a store window once, and she was hunched over a little bit with a strange loping gait. The weight of her head pulled her whole body forward. Those teeth were meant for something. She could imagine the feel of a shell or a bone cracking between her molars. Imagining that and, joy and enjoying imagining it changed her. She began to see their fear as inferiority. Her sister asked her how she was feeling, and she answered, superb, absolutely superb, like I've met my own expectations. I view things differently. I look about me at the people scurrying by, looking over their shoulders, giving me the white eye, and I have to confess that it fills me with joy and expectation. I like to look at their throats, for instance, how tender they are, how easily broken, and their hearts, I can almost hear them quicken. I am looking at prey, dear sister. That's a horrible thing to say, Isabel. Truly horrible. You make it seem like you're a savage, a monster. Have you forgotten your tender side? I have indeed, Isabel said. And her mouth, which was already huge, stretched even wider, so wide that her sister shuddered. You weren't thinking about eating me, her sister asked weakly. Isabel looked upward contemplating the ceiling, trying to restrain her fury and sadness. For a moment, yes, I was, she said finally. But then I remember that you once tied my shoelaces without complaining. I've done more than that. Her objection was fierce, but then her gaze stuck on Isabel's teeth, pointed at the ends, more teeth than she had ever seen before, and Isabel's eyes familiar, but with something dark behind them. I always loved you she ended lamely. I still love you. Do you love me? For a moment, Isabel felt a tug of despair, for she had once known what it was to expect love. She buried that thought and shrugged. Love, she said dismissively. Love comes and goes. Old love gets overwhelmed by new love. Love for mother gets pushed aside by love for children. Things are bright and fresh and delicious, and then they get old and tough and chewy. It's in the order of things because the world is teeming and everything has a mouth. Her sister couldn't mask her concern. You were always kind. I don't know if you still are. She looked away and then quickly back 
What do you eat these days? Isabel was delighted. Oh, he's straight to the punch, she cried. I still admire that. Asking questions when you fear the answer you think you already know. Do I know? Her sister asked, faltering. Isabel's face got suddenly stern, which was a horrible sight, considering all those teeth. You have known me all my life, and you have just misjudged me. I can see it in your eyes, in your mouth, in your teeth, even. Your appearance has changed so much, her sister said quietly. How do I know what that means? How can I find out what it means if you tell me nothing? A great silence grew, and Isabel's sister began to shift uncomfortably. Isabel, you're shutting me out. We should be able to speak about anything that upsets one or the other. I upset you, Isabel hissed. It doesn't upset you the way you look now. You were once very pretty. Is that what matters to you? It matters to everyone, whether they admit it or not. This is a world that doesn't celebrate. She stopped for a moment, then gathered her strength. Ugliness doesn't celebrate ugliness. So I'm ugly. Yes, her sister breathed. There was silence again, and her sister struggled against a fear that prompted her to run out of the room, pursued, she imagined, by this beast that once was her sister. And then, after a pause, her sister laughed bitterly. Isabel began to dress in an ostentatious fashion. She wore heavy cloth culottes and tapestry jackets and tall caps made of velour and taffeta. Her friend Robin was an events planner, and Isabel suggested she be invited to some of the more outrageous events. Where they want spectacle, she said. She sometimes lisped now, as her mouth was so full of teeth that her pronunciation was off. I can provide spectacle. As indeed she could, Robin realized. But she was reluctant to parade her friend around that way. They may see you as a freak, she said. As long as I get to be a freak on my own terms, Isabel replied. Isabel added a cape at the last minute, and when she entered the party, someone flicked the lights up and everyone turned. Isabel opened her mouth and threw her head back. Give me something to eat, she cried, and someone in the back screamed and tittered. Robin grabbed a goblet of wine and ran up to her. Before you eat, my dear, you must propose a toast. Isabel's entrance had startled the room. People stopped and twisted around in twos and threes to gape at her. Robin hoped a drink would make it seem more scripted. But Isabel could feel the distrust and dismay passing from one guest to another. She raised her glass high and said, I will dare anyone to kiss me. Is anyone brave enough to find out whether these teeth are meant for loving? Would someone like to count how many teeth I have? The better to eat you with? There were squeals as someone pushed someone else forward, who turned and pushed back in a way. Isabel stood there, her arms crossed, her great mouth gleaming, her eyes shifting through the crowd. Finally, she raised her hand and pointed. You, she said. The crowd parted to see who she was pointing at, and it was a heavy young man with longish hair whose startled face ran pale as soon as he saw where she pointed. He froze, but then all eyes were on him, and he shook himself upright and walked slowly towards Isabel. Dance with me, Isabel said, and Robin signaled the band to begin again. I don't really dance much, the man said apologetically. It's all right. In a minute, I'll eat you, and no one will remember how badly you danced. The man fainted. Another one, Isabel shouted. She raised her hand again. You! That man ran out of the room. She kept her hand up, her fingers pointing. You! But that one shook his head and shrank away. You can choose me, a voice called out, and the crowd parted again to reveal a man with a long face and the bluest eyes that Isabel had ever seen. His white shirt had a high collar under a dark fitted jacket. His hair was white, and though his bony face had no wrinkles, his skin looked thin as paper. Isabel's grin made her teeth even more pronounced. Come to me, she crooned in her deep, husky voice. Her eyes glittered. The man stopped directly in front of her. Your name, she asked. I am death, he said. It sounded sweet coming from him. It might even be a witticism of some kind. She never understood witticisms. Death, 
she said. It didn't surprise her completely. She had been thinking about death lately, though she wouldn't admit it to anyone. She was strong and contemptuous of the weak. When she thought of death, it was not in triumph or defeat. It was in longing. He held his hand out, and miraculously the music in the room turned slow and romantic. His hand was cool and dry at first, but it began to grow warmer as they danced. He touched her lightly and held himself with a suppleness that was beautiful. He moved gracefully, and she became aware that she also moved gracefully in response to him. Each time she looked at him, he was looking back at her with a kind smile. Death, she asked. Is that a family name or a nickname? You know it isn't. And I'll stop there. Thank you. There's more, of course. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. You know, I'm sitting here singing to myself. These teeth were made for a loving. That's just <laughs> what they'll do. <laughs> that's awesome. You could say that's, that's awesome. a story with bite. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's terrific. That's terrific. I am always intrigued with your work because you you take what seems like a normal <coughs> thing and then just one little thing goes weird. It's like there's this giant, oh, I have this, I, uh-oh, I had this this cap on the front. Maybe I am going to go that way. Uh-oh. <laughs> right now. Yeah. Well, I but also you, love the description of the clothing. Mm -hmm. That I just yeah. had an image of Grace Jones walking into a party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not you wrong. Know? Not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you got some nice, uh, nice comments. He left us on a cliffhanger there. So uh, we have a, a question from Chris Ryan. The evolution of the teeth, people's reaction, and Isabella's persona is wonderful. Can you discuss the process of making such complex story elements as organic as they feel here? Does that make sense for you? I'm, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm very good at clarifying process for me. I okay. just start somewhere a lot of the time. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, I'll put it aside for uh, uh, up to 10 years even sometimes and come mm -hmm. back to it when it makes sense to me. And I don't always remember exactly what got me started with the teeth even. I, mm -hmm. You know, if I could remember that, most of my stories start with an image or an idea. Um, okay. They rarely, occasionally it happens, but they rarely start with a character. There's always something about an image that makes me want to uh, explore it, look at it, um, and decode it. What is making that image seem so attractive to me? And it might be positive aspects. It might be negative aspects. It might be um, surprising aspects that I don't even know yet. Um, so I, I feel inadequate. <laughs> I'm not very good at answering the question. Um, and I don't even know why death popped up, but the, the rest of the story has to do with death. Um, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was interesting though, because if it had not been something like death, what would have happened then? You know, it would, it, it, she would have eaten all the guys, you know, right. It would have, it would have petered. Yeah. yeah. It would have, um, it would have petered out because I'm, I'm not really good at, even though she kills, or even though a lot of people are killed in the <laughs> in the course of this story, I'm not really very um, pro killing a lot of people. So. <laughs> uh, 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 I I heard that cat, and that cat of yours is pro killing a lot of people. <laughs> but he says, no, no, no. He says distinctly, but I never kill them, you know. That's true. That's yes, true. yes, in the splendid city, yes. I, I, I thought the, the <laughs> thing that, that caught me about this was the nuanced moment where she says, um, I remembered you once tied my shoe. Yeah, yeah. That to me is such a sweet moment because it evokes all sorts of lovely childhood and security things in the midst of this um uh, self-evolving and dangerous person, but she remembers that moment. It's like the thorn out of the the, the lion's paw. Kind and of. I think it's it's really true for a lot of us that some very trivial moments have a lot more weight to them than we would think possible. Uh, but there was something touching about her shoelaces being tied by her sister that she carried forward. I'm sure there were moments that her sister would have thought would have been more important, but that particular one carries some meaning for her. And it's just interesting. I think we all do that. We all have strange 
little quirky memories. Um, mm -hmm. I think that comes out most when you're when you have a loved one you're missing. There'll be odd moments the way a a, a chair is arranged in a room. Yes, you pull back a memory of an aunt or a loved one. And yes, I, I think that you're right with that. It is those odd moments those insignificant moments that are really the significant stitching between the significant moments. Yeah. And, and speaking of which in the stitching, I'm sitting here in a room surrounded by the quilts that my grandmother made, you know? So really? Yeah. yeah Cause yeah. I was admiring them earlier and I thought, wait, is that a background or are they really there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the really background, there. The background is a hologram. Yeah, if if it starts moving and I haven't touched it, please let me know. Yeah. <laughs> no, that would be great. That'd be great. Well, I um I'm always interested in in hearing your pieces when you read them and you have a wonderful way of doing even the dialogue that you write is really cool because sometimes just the shortest little sentence in in this I don't remember the exact words but one character asked the other, "Don't you think something?" and they said Yes. And that's like, oh, okay. That's the way people would answer. They wouldn't give a whole speech explaining why the yeah, answer was yeah, correct. Yeah. You know, it's very nicely focused. Very well done. That's cool. No, I, I, again, you, you, you say you start with an image and I think that's pretty clear that your images are, um, they're almost like images that you would find at the moment of sleep, that they're, they're not, it's, uh, a slightly left turn from normal everyday image and then you follow that down yeah you know i'm in alpha or i don't know whether we still say that back when i was young there was all this discussion about alpha states being the most creative mm -hmm. states yeah. i i drove back i drive back and forth an awful lot um and that happens to be the time when i do my most effective plotting uh, mm -hmm. which is not outlining is just sort of oh i think that i'm gonna go here now you know that kind of thing and uh, this business you may call it daydreaming i spend almost all of my life just daydreaming and it's daydreaming that leads me from an image to a story. It's just like, oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And then it was just like, I'll start thinking about it and just drifting in my head. And it will uh, very often lead me in the right direction for a story. Um, it makes it really difficult for me to have a uh, ongoing conversations with people because they drift away an awful lot. Um, but that's, that's basically the way I write is just to sort of drift uh, around a lot until I find the next page, you know, kind of like the next conversation, the next event, whatever. And um, that, that's true for just about all the stories in this collection is that they almost always start with an image or, or, or a word play of some kind, a phrase might occur to me and it's just an interesting phrase. And I'll say, Oh, what do you know, turn that's it around Bradbury a little bit. What have you got? You know, that's how so. Bradbury would work. He would, he would have an image or a phrase and then just start writing. Yeah. Yeah. It. yeah. Cool. And it, 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 it very often works for me. I'm not sure it works for everyone. Um, but I'm, I'm relaxed with it, you know, whether it works or not, I'm still relaxed with, um, however it turns out. And I've waited 10 years to finish a story uh, because the right next image didn't come. So, oh, mm -hmm. I can wait. I can wait. <laughs> Any, anyone who says there's one way to write doesn't yeah. know anything about writing. So. I know. I sometimes admire people who can outline and who can just, you know, have at it. Until I imagine you were a very industrious writer um, since you publish what a, a novel a week or something, <laughs> I pity the people who can outline. <laughs> so I just, I often do the same thing. I don't have an image or a moment. Um, I do almost always start with character, but it yes. will be that character in a moment or an image or a mood that I want that character in, and then I go and, yeah. you know, yeah. I often I write my stories because I want to find out what happens at the end. Sometimes I'm a little afraid of what's going to happen at the end, but yes, I'm with you. And yes. Carol, what is, is your process like that too? Or are you? 
I, you... I tend to get an overall idea of the whole thing, uh, but I also enjoy the the non the disassociative time. I, I drove to Chicago for uh, for Chicon, and um, I had you know nine hours in the car one day, so I spent six hours thinking, thinking, thinking about the yeah. story, and then I got out my dictation and I dictated the story, and then when I got there to the hotel, I transcribed it and found out what I'd written. So yeah, that yeah. Works. yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. I Only discovered there's no traffic though, and it's safe. yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. I cannot do it if it's a new route. I mean, for me, it's you right, know, you driving to, back. Yeah, at, yeah, my standard drive back and forth is about two hours, and and that's mm -hmm. bliss. But um, if it's a route, I don't know. It's, it's a different thing entirely. Yeah. But I discovered by accident. I'm not. I'm sure most writers have the same thing that you always have to be doing something. If you're mm -hmm. sitting down, it's to read or to write, revise, send out, whatever, but you always have to be doing something. And the right. other day I just sat down, looked out the window and started thinking about something I was writing. And this may sound crazy, but th this whole thing of you've got to be doing, you can't just sit and think. Of course you do sit and think, but I deliberately sat and thought, you know, and it was just like, Oh, this could happen a lot more often. You know? okay. <laughs> I don't well, have to drive. <laughs> we're gonna, well, that's going to be much better for the environment. Thank yes, God. it will. <laughs> we'll awesome. Just get you a steering wheel you can hold while you're that's looking. True. You. That's true. I need that. I need a little, I'm going to sit in my little, my little box in the basement yes. with a little pretend wheel. Okay, we'll get so much more done. Well, thank you. This has been so much fun exploring a little bit about what's inside your head with these wonderful stories. What I'd love to do now is invite the rest of our, our authors back up. We'll, we can chat for a few minutes. Let's bring up Kenneth and Nicholas. Hey, thank you everybody for reading such great, terrific work. It's been so much fun hearing um, both the fiction and the nonfiction, which I think is a tremendous addition. Uh, Nick, uh, with with you and Michelle last month, adding some uh, some academic uh, uh, critique into the I mix. Think I think this may be the widest range of type of story and reading that has been on any one show. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah. Uh, so what uh what's what's everybody doing? It's November. Can you believe it's November now? How did this happen? I don't know. When it's the pecan pie month. It's, it's the which one? It's pecan pie month. Oh. You're you're just you know, you're you're ignoring the pumpkin spice and going for pecan pie. Okay, that's fair. I, I can go with that. <laughs> I have half my family is southern, so yeah, pecan pies are a, a no, it's half price chocolate and candy month. <laughs> okay. That too. That too. Yeah. Oh, so what's uh what's going on with everybody? Are you you working on anything new? Are you something new coming? Karen, I know this one is coming out in just a, about a, a a couple weeks, right? Yes, I think the week after next for this one, yes. Okay. And tell us the name of it again, please. Uh, a slice of the dark. Excellent. Excellent. A collection of interesting, weird stories. Not to what? be confused with chopping up Nicholas Dyack. <laughs> ah. And I have one more question for you, Karen. Do you what genre do you call these stories? Do you call them a genre? Is it weird fiction? Is it? I, you know, I, I incline to say dark fantasy. Although there's definitely one or two horror in here, and a couple of <sighs> magic realism is in here. I guess in a couple. Okay. So there's a bunch of. Um, my usual mix. <laughs> Your usual mix of interesting, weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kenneth, how about you? The, I, I, I know you said that there's some things being republished now, right? Uh, yeah, I have uh, my backlist coming out through Crossroads Press right now. Um, and I, I'm currently reading for my next anthology, which is Never Wake, uh, coming out through Crystal Lake. Okay. And then I have a collection coming out from uh, Cemetery Gates Media next year. Uh, and I haven't told anyone the title yet, so it's Hell, Delaware. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Over below the canal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrific. Oh, I look forward to hearing that, yeah. Is that, uh, what, what What genre would you call it? Um, I, I kind of, uh, I do a lot of, of mashing genres and everything, so it's mostly yeah. uh, horror and, uh, and dark fiction, but... Uh, this one's kind of interesting because I kind of created my own like little town, you know, taking um, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, try to tie all the stories together. So we'll see how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, that's kind of fun. I, I, I think we have a lot of uh, genre mashing going on here, which I think is really kind of cool. Yeah. I think having having a horror writer as a, as a town planner is a very dangerous idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many subterranean caches are there for the various monsters? Yes. <laughs> and what is in the sewer drain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. How about you, Nicholas? Uh, what's what's your vote on your cocktail for the evening? What's that about my cocktail? Yeah, did did was that a good choice? Oh yeah, Shrunk and Skull. It's a super easy one to make. It's a uh, one part grenadine, one part lime juice, one part demerara rum, and one part Cuban rum. But you can't get Cuban rum here, so I just use a Hamilton Navy strength rum. Uh huh. Um, so it's super easy to make. <laughs> Uh, well, assuming one has all those things on hand, which I yes. am pretty sure that you do at all times. Is that fair? Yeah. This is very fair. In fact, you can probably see right behind me, there's the cocktail book collection. Down there's all the libations for making stuff at. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's fair. That's really cool. <laughs> so, uh, Teal, how about yourself, sir? What's what's new with you? What's what's coming out, or what has just come out that uh, happens just, to be number I, one? You know, I just had <clears throat> um, uh, Mightier Than the Sword, a uh, collection of three novellas. I, I have one. There's two other authors, um, and it's uh, what if um, <clears throat> the writer were the hero? So my Mightier Than the Sword is a a Robert Howard boxing story with Robert Howard as the boxer, uh, the guy who created yeah. Conan. Yeah. And then I have um, the Cowboy and the Conqueror, uh, the Cowboy and the Contest coming out in about two to three weeks, uh, depending on when they get their formatting done, which is the third book in my Robert E. Howard um, series. Um, it's um, Robert E. Howard goes to the land of the Fae, gets involved in a boxing contest uh, and a poetry contest. Um, but I, I have, it's the third book in a series, Cowboy and the Carpathia, and um, Cowboy and the Conqueror. Um, and, oh, and that's eventually. a series. And that's a series for which you got an award on the first book, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, Cowboy and Carpathia got an award as best pulp uh, novel for the year. Okay. Oh. Excellent. Excellent. And Carol, what about you? What's up next with you? Well, how nice of you to ask. I, I have something. Um, I just happen to have a picture because I forgot to bring the book down. This is an anthology called A Woman Unbecoming that I co-edited with Rachel A. Brune from Crone Girls Press. And this is in response to the reversal of Roe v. Wade. And oh, Teal has one. He has a, a delightful poem woman here as well. So uh, it, we have a bunch of terrific authors in here. We put the thing together in two months once Roe v. Wade was, um, was overturned. And then we got the print option out shortly thereafter and it benefits reproductive health care services um, and we also were able to make some donations to um, midterm election folks who supported reproductive care. In so, incredibly powerful stories with a purpose. Um, yeah. Some wonderful authors in there too. Yeah, we just we just asked that the, as soon as we ran into an author within like a week, we asked them if they had something. We took it and we we edited and you know Ken, uh, uh, I think we might have been channeling a little bit of your energy, sir, because uh, yeah, we got that thing done in a hurry. So yeah, but it's so cool. So um, I don't know how many of you might be at uh, PhilCon coming up in a weekend after next, but I hope to see you there. If you are Teal, you'll be there, right? Yep. Yep. And. Uh, I'll be there. Karen, do you do you go to PhilCon? Um, I went once or twice. Unfortunately, I have surgery a couple of days after PhilCon. Oh, okay. And my surgery was okay. rescheduled because I got COVID a week before I was supposed to have it in September. So I was just like, uh, I don't think I'm gonna go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Better better to be the safe thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's really smart. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing that I will uh, I will mention two more things. We have our newsletter. Um that is, uh, I'm just looking for my wonderful link because I had it here a minute ago. It's fun when you get to do all the things at once. I know. <laughs> yeah. Just like juggling chainsaws and bowling balls, it's fine. Mm. 
Yeah. Oh, folks, folks in the chat will be a PhilCon as well. That's awesome. Yes, That's I awesome. see that. Yeah. yeah. So please, if you have not yet already, sign up for our newsletter. Our three authors have been kind enough to offer an ebook. Uh, we will pull um, three random names off people who are on our newsletter list on Sunday night, and we will get those out to you. So keep an eye open for something from Kenneth W. Kane. And the W is important because there's somebody else with that same name. We want to focus on the W <laughs> from Karen Hewler and from Nicholas Dyack. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, coming up next month, our reading will be, we're always on the second Thursday. Our reading will be December 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we have Randy Dawn and Todd Kiesling joining us as well. And another mystery guest who we will reveal later. Ooh. So thank you everybody for joining us. I Thanks hope to see us. everybody next, next month. All <laughs> thank right. you for having me. Fun. I'm going to figure out how to do this part. I know how to do it. Hold on. I do. You, I you've been doing a marvelous job, both of you. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just Pay no it. attention to the woman behind the curtain. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, she wait. pushes That's the buttons. Right. I just go, ah. I, 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 <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.